All right, so we finished off last week out of um, our series on the hard sayings of Jesus. That's sorry, not sorry. So, so this, week, uh, uh, this week and next week, uh, there's going to be a little bit of a theme. And, and for those who watch some TV in the 70s and 80s, you might recognize it. But this morning, it's, it's to boldly go. And um, I wonder if you've, if you've got your Bibles, let's just crack straight on and, and turn um, to Acts chapter 4. So if you would open your Bibles to Acts chapter 4, we're going to read the disciples, the early disciples' response to some difficulty in their life, some, some tough circumstances that they were facing. And hey, if I'm often, I often, I, I found myself, I've been measuring it, I often pray for God to change my circumstances. And when I pray for others, I'm often praying for God to change their circumstances. It's something that in preparing for this over the last couple of weeks, I've, been, I've literally been like measuring and I catch myself doing it all the time. It's praying for God to change circumstances. And if we're honest, that's, that's kind of what we all pray for a lot. It might not be everything we pray for, hopefully, but it's what we pray for a lot because we want stuff to change. We, don't, we want our circumstances to change. We, we want to make things more comfortable. We want, to make, um, we want, want things to be safer, even. It, it, we want things to be better. It's what we as a society would call progress. We want to see progress. We want to see things improve. But here's what the disciples did when they faced some tough situations. So Acts, Acts chapter 4, you're all there. I'm going to read out of the NRV. Um, and mine reads like this. Acts chapter 4 from verse 29. So, so close to the end. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. It's incredible. What has happened here is Jesus has ascended. He's crucified. He's resurrected. He's ascended to heaven. The disciples are now living out their faith boldly. And Peter and John have just been to the temple, as they normally did, and they saw the beggar sitting there and took notice of him for that moment, called him up to stand on his feet. He got up, started jumping around man who had been crippled from birth. All of a sudden, not only did his legs and feet work, but he learned how to walk in an instant. I mean, we often don't think of that. I mean, we think of like the healing that happens, but there's also like he had to learn how to walk in an instant there. It's incredible. If you've, had, if you've ever had any injuries or any major things that happen and, and you're on your back for a long time or you're not able to use it, you have to learn to walk again. So never mind the, the first... The first time you have to learn to walk, but even if, so this guy gets his legs healed, learns to walk again. The, the, the Pharisees and that are upset by what's going on. And so they call um, Peter and John in and they tell them, listen, this is, this is not right. You guys shouldn't be doing this. You're causing an uproar. Stop it. You, you stop it. And Peter and, James and John, uh, Peter and John are released and they go back to, to the, the disciples, the rest of the people, tell them what the, what the priests and the elders had said to them. And then this is their prayer out of those circumstances. And it's incredible because they, it says there, they, now Lord, consider their threats. So in other words, the threats of the, the religious and effectively of their own nation, political leaders of the time, had basically said, you need to stop what you're doing. This wasn't just an idle suggestion. It wasn't just, it wasn't like a stop street in Matuba. It was like, it was, a, it was an actual enforcement of like, you need to stop this or it's going to be the end for you. He's, that's the threat. That's the level of, of what they were being threatened with. And so the disciples say, consider their threats and make them go away. No. Consider their threats and bring someone else into power. Bring a different government in. We need a different party in power. No. They say, consider their threats and enable us to speak your word with great boldness. It's an incredible response in that situation. You see, I think more often than not, when we say, Lord, won't you change the circumstance, God says, let the circumstance change you. I think so often that is God's response in those times. Rather than removing the circumstance and making life cushy and, and easy, I believe God uses those moments to draw us closer to Him, number one, and to become more reliant on Him. And we need to use those and see those opportunities to grow in our boldness for Him. You see, when we, are, when we are with God and we are relying on Him, 
we're able to be bold because we're not worried about the things of this world. But what does boldness look like? How do we, how do we change from being intimidated to being bold for the gospel? How do we change from being fearful to being fearless, from, from being those who are timid to being those who are confident in sharing the gospel? And we're going to take a look at the life of Gideon. So if you want to, you can follow along. It's in Judges chapter 6. You can turn there. We're going to just read some excerpts out of the life of Gideon and see what God does with him. But there's, there's other examples you can look at. There's Moses, there's Joshua, there's uh, David, Peter, John. Uh, over and over we see God, how God walks with people and brings people to a different place from where they were. And, and the key for me in this, for us and our disciples to Jesus, is that there is only one thing that you get to take with you when you die. And it's who you are. So who you become is, is critical in our eternal life with Jesus. And that's the time we have now, is to walk with Jesus, to disciple with Jesus, so that we can transform to become more like him and live out of that place. Judges chapter 6. So where does boldness come from? And I've got five E's, four E's, five E's this morning. Okay, good. Appreciate we got to alliterate. I had to work hard to get some of them. But anyway, <laughs> encounter, Google, synonym for, and then. So the first one, Judges 6, verses 11 to 12. This is, this is I believe, where boldness starts, is an encounter with God. And the beauty is that God doesn't just give us his word, give us the Bible, and leave us to figure it out. He's not like a watchmaker who set up the universe and stepped back and said, well, let's see, when time runs out, we'll deal with the end time. He's a loving father who's involved. He's invested. He's part of our lives. He's not only big and transcendent and the God overall, but he's also intimate and close and personal and a God who's real with us. So, first encounter, Judges chapter 6. Are you all there? 11 and 12. The angel of the Lord. Uh, just quickly, I'm, I'm going to touch on two things here. Lord, like that, in some Bibles you'll see it's, it's all capital letters. The O-R-D are slightly smaller, but it's the capital L, capital O-R-D. And what our English translators are trying to show us is that they're using the name of God there. They're using Yahweh. So I'm going to read it just so that it says that. Your, your Bible might not read it like that, but it's important that we just stick with me for that on a while. So, the angel of Yahweh came and sat under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of Yahweh appeared to Gideon, he said, Yahweh is with you, mighty warrior. So just as a side note quickly, and I'm just going to nerd out for you on five minutes. So if you want to check social media, now's the time. But who is this angel of the Lord? It's, a, it's such an incredible picture and such an interesting thing because he's a, he's a weird character who shows up every now and again. And he, it's mostly in the Old Testament. We see him and he shows up in the Old Testament. There's over 60 references to this angel of Yahweh, angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, not an angel. Um, and what I'm going to share with you now comes, this little summary comes mostly out of a, a video done by The Bible Project. So if you've heard of The Bible Project, it's two guys, Tim Mackey and John Collins, who are brilliant on short little video clips that explain things in the Bible. Um, Tim Mackey is a phenomenal Bible scholar and teacher. So I'd encourage you to go and have a look at it. They've got a YouTube video. I think it's about seven and a half minutes. It's literally called The Angel of the Lord. Um, and they explain it far better than I can. But just so we're all on the same page, what it, what it is, is he explains it like this. He says, we've got the, the biblical worldview kind of has these two realms of heaven and earth, the heavens and the earth. And sometimes those two realms overlap. And when it does, we see either weird things happening or weird characters. And by weird, I just mean things that we're not used to. Not weird as in like that is, don't do that, that's weird. But just weird as in things that are outside our normal frame of reference. And that's what we have here, is something of a heavenly being appearing in an earthly realm. And so, I mean, those can be sometimes things like visions, um, sometimes God speaking or actions or angelic beings or, or spiritual beings and things like that. So often... It's this angel of Yahweh that we see it. And, and from, what we, from what we see in these references to the angel of Yahweh is that he's not just an ordinary angel. And there's a couple of reasons why, and scholars agree on this, that he's, he's not just a, a regular angel. So the word angel is literally a messenger or a sent one. So that's what it means. They're just angelic beings. They are created beings who God created, and they are often sent to, get, to convey messages. But what makes him not an ordinary angel is that Number one, he accepts worship from people. 
Whereas if we read about an, the angel that came to John in the book of Revelation, John starts to worship the angel. The angel says, no, no, you shouldn't be worshiping me. Worship is reserved for God. So, but this angel, when it, when it comes into certain situations, the angel of Yahweh, we see people worshiping him and he accepts it. And he accepts a sacrifice often that is made in front of him or to him. Sometimes he is spoken of in the third person as being, as being of God or sent by God. But he's also spoken of in the first person as God. So it can be a bit perplexing and it can be a bit weird. And sometimes he himself speaks as God. He's directly called God on a, few, on a few occasions by those who encounter him. And again, he only he receives things that are made for God. So Tim Mackey puts it like this. This is a quote from him. He says, The angel of the Lord is the royal glory of God appearing in human form. And I love that. It's just such a... So it's, a, it's a heavy, weighty sentence, but it's a nice, succinct way of seeing it. The angel of the Lord is the royal glory of God appearing in human form. Now, if you go and read John chapter 1, it might give you a clue as to who the angel of the Lord is. Because John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John is speaking of Jesus, of course. Now, there's a couple of different views on this, and because it's not uh, absolutely clear in the, in the Scripture, we can agree to disagree on this. But my, as best as I can understand it and, and looking at it, and as, as best as I can see what he does through Scripture, I believe that the angel of Yahweh in this thing is a pre-incarnate image or picture of Jesus. He's, the, he's a, a representation of the pre-incarnate Christ. So before the Messiah comes, before Jesus comes, he is a representation of who Jesus is within the Trinity come to mankind. He is a representation of the royal glory of God in human form. I love that picture. And there's a couple of, couple of other people who agree with that um, right throughout church history from the earliest Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Theophilus of Antioch, and Tertullian came to the same conclusion. So it's not a new thing that's coming out. And there's many through church history who agree with that. But there are some who don't. Anyway, so... That being said, right, side note, so back to Gideon. So Gideon encounters this weird character who is God, sent by God, and to give him a message from God. Nice and clear cut and, and unmuddied those waters. So what he does is Gideon here, effectively, the first thing, the first E in this boldness, the step to becoming bold, is an encounter. So Gideon encounters God, and he realizes he's encountered God, and he goes, oh no, I'm going to die because I've seen God. Because he understood that, as the Bible promises in the Old Testament, that you could not see God face to face with and still live because we are fallen and sinful and broken. But he doesn't die. And this starts his journey from terrified to trusting. So the second thing that God does in this moment is he not only encounters Gideon, but he engages Gideon. And not just engages with him, but engages like puts him in gear like a commissioning. There's an engaging that happens with Gideon in this moment. And we're going to just read verse 14 out of Judges 6. And it says, Yahweh turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? So you see there's a, there's a commissioning that comes. And God engages him in his present circumstances. He says, Go with what you already have. Now if you understand Gideon's situation here, you might think, Lord, maybe you should give him something, like a magical sword, or he needs some. You know, like the hero always finds like this amazing, pull the sword out the stone or the shield of vibranium or something. You need something that's going to... But God says, go with what you have. Gideon, as we read, is threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, you can tell just by the name, it's not the right place for wheat. It's a key, it's a little clue, giveaway there. But what he's doing is he's hiding because if you read in Judges a bit earlier, what would happen is the Midianites, every time the Israelites would harvest, the Midianites and these raiding bands would come down, steal their, wait for them to harvest the crops and, and process them, and then come and steal their crops and their fruit and veggies and all that sort of stuff. So Gideon here is hiding. He's got his little crop and he's hiding in a wine press, kind of trying to sort the wheat out and process it quietly without anybody seeing, without anybody knowing, so that he can... And God says, I want you to go... And defeat this nation that is coming against you. So, so Gideon, he, he, he feels like he can't even protect his own crop from a small raiding band. God says, I want you to deliver your whole nation from that whole nation. It's kind of like, Lord, I, I'm struggling with this little bit. 
Like, how am I going to handle that big thing that you're giving me? And God engages him and says, go with what you already have. And Gideon's response is amazing. He has this incredible response. And, and it's, it's like all of our responses. When we encounter God, <clears throat> excuse me, and we are engaged by God, what does Gideon do? Yes, Lord, here am I, send me. No, Gideon says, I've got a couple of excuses. And that's my third E. We always come up with excuses when God commissions us or engages us. Verse 13, Gideon says, just, just so you know, you've abandoned us. Verse 15, my clan is the weakest. Verse 15, I am the least in my family. In other words, choose someone else. Please, Lord, pick someone else. I'm not the chosen one. Man, we, we offer up excuses so quickly when God engages us. We might not worry about clan size and least in family and things like that, but we always go, you know, Lord, I just don't have the right vehicle to go to the nations. Lord, I, I just, you know, I, I, don't, I haven't studied enough to share the gospel with my family. You know, Lord, you know, my bank account really isn't big enough to give this week. God, I, I don't know that I, I know how to pray enough to pray for someone. God, I've, I've never seen someone healed and yeah, you're asking me to heal, pray for healing. I, I, we come up with excuses so often. It's easy to see them in someone else, but when we self-evaluate, it's a little bit more painful. But it's not just us. Sigh of relief. It's a fallen human sinful nature thing. And we see it right from the beginning, right from Adam and Eve in the garden. Lord, it's this wife you gave me. It's not my fault. You gave me, her to me. How many of us husbands are we still using that excuse? It's this wife you gave me, Lord. But it carries on. Human. <laughs> so, but it's a human thing. We see it, we see it with Cain. <laughs> we see it with Cain. We see it with Moses. Moses going like, Lord, God says, I want you to go to Pharaoh. God encounters Moses, burning bush. He engages him. Moses comes to the, I can't speak. I'm, I'm, I'm poor of speech. Send someone else. You need the speaking thing and not for me, Lord. God says, I want you to go. Jeremiah, Jonah, the disciples of Jesus, the list goes on. We're all the same. We all come up with these excuses because we are timid. Fortunately, and I love this, is that God counters the excuses that are coming. He, he has one little preemptive strike in verse 12 where, where God it says, Yahweh is with you, mighty warrior. And that's an incredible statement. Because if you remember that gospel prayer that we did from J.D. Greer a while ago, those fridge magnets that are up there, there's, there's a little section in the middle that says, your presence and approval are all I need for life. And that's what God does here with, with Gideon, is he says, you've got my presence and you've got my approval. He's speaking not only to identity, he's saying, Gideon, he's calling Gideon a mighty warrior. Gideon has not fought a battle in his life that we know of. He is hiding in a wine press threshing wheat. He is a, he is a small scale subsistence farmer. And God calls him mighty warrior. He says, I am with you. The Lord is with you. Yahweh is with you. Mighty warrior. Presence and approval. That's what we need for boldness. Verse 16, after his excuses that he came with, it says, Yahweh answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites. So now God again reassures him, you're going to have my presence with you and this will be the outcome. God even gives him a little sneak peek as to what will be the outcome. So now he said, this is what I want you to do. And you can kind of come with the excuses. And then God says, no, no, I'm going to be with you. And the outcome is guaranteed. Friends, our outcome is guaranteed. I don't know if you've read the end yet. I know it's still not quite the end of the year. So maybe your Bible reading plan hasn't got there. But if you've read the end of the book, Jesus comes back and he is victorious. And we get to be a part of that. That is the outcome we all get to live in. And God's promise is that he will be with us. So you would think after all of this, the encounter, the engaging, the excuses answered, that Gideon would be ready to walk on water, climb out of the wine's press, take on the world. God has promised him everything, including his presence. And it's amazing. The first thing that God asked him to do in this process of to boldly go, of, of Gideon becoming one who boldly goes, he says, I want you to cut down your father's Asherah pole and the, the Baal altar that he's built on this high place. So the Israelites were worshipping to other gods. This is um, 
is a, things weren't going well for the nation and so they were picking and choosing these gods of the nations around them to try and make crops grow and make rain come and make cattle not get sick and and so they were worshiping and they built this altar his dad had built an altar and this other pole next to it which is kind of like a totem pole type thing and so God says, I want you to go and cut this down. So you can imagine Gideon had this encounter with the angel of Yahweh. God said, I'm with you. You have my presence and approval. You're a mighty warrior. You're going to defeat a nation. But first, I just want you to go and cut this pole down and break up that pile of rocks. And so Gideon, you would imagine him. He would be, he'd be like just brimming with confidence. So what he does is he bravely goes in the middle of the night when no one can see him and he does it quietly. And then there's nowhere to be found the next day when they try. He's kind of like brave Sir Robin. If you've seen it, that's him. That's Gideon in that moment. Mike, you'd appreciate that, eh? So that's what Gideon is like. It's a Monty Python reference for those who are unsure. And so what he does is he, even in that moment, doing a small thing, it was his father's altar. He, it was an altar to an idol. And he breaks it down in the middle of the night and he hides. The next day the people come and they see this and they're trying to, they've got to launch an investigation and they figure out who it is. And then his father actually defends him incredibly. And his father says, well, if Baal's unhappy, let Baal come and deal with Gideon. And so the people say, well, that's fine. Let him be like that. But what we see of Gideon is that he's not exactly this bold, mighty, fearless, mighty warrior that you would want to lead your nation. He's not that kind, he's not that kind of guy. Yeah. But God does something even more amazing. And this, for me, is where the key to our boldness comes from is that God empowers Gideon. So my fourth e is the empowering for the task. God empowers Gideon to be bold. Judges 6 verses 33 and 34, but further down in the chapter, reads like this. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Here's the empowering that comes. Then the spirit of Yahweh came on Gideon. An incredible thing happens. See, in the Old Testament, it's clear when the Spirit comes on people because it didn't happen all the time. It wasn't something that was, he wasn't something that was present with people all the time. He would come on people for moments, for times, for seasons, for acts of service. And that's what happens here. That's the difference. Even after the promises, even after the reassurance, the countering of his excuses, God knows that without the Spirit, Gideon is not going to be able to be bold and do what he's called him to do. It's incredible, friends. We sometimes look for those prophetic words. We look for encouragements from God. We look for physical things. And those are great and we need them and they're wonderful. But it's the empowering by God's Holy Spirit that makes the difference in our boldness. Gideon is then emboldened by God's call, God's truth and God's empowering. But he still has doubts. He still has doubts in those moments. And God is so patient and gracious to deal with Gideon in that. And he puts out the fleece and God kind of, if you know the story, and he says, like, make the fleece wet and the ground dry. And God does it. And then he says, okay, Lord, just hear me out one more time. Like, the, tonight, like, just in case that was a fluke, tonight, make the ground wet and the fleece dry. And God does it again. And I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a, a model for how we should all live. I think God is just accommodating of Gideon's doubt and fear there. But God is patient. And he allows his, he allows, he allays his doubts. Even with this going up to the camp and hearing the men talk, God says, if you go, they will come. And so for us, friends, we too need to live in that place of being empowered by the Holy Spirit for our boldness. See, we can, we can go boldly without God, but you're going to bang your head. You're going to run into a very hard wall very quickly. But when we run in the power of the Spirit, when we walk, crawl, whatever it might be, in the power of the Holy Spirit, then we are emboldened to share God's word in a way that brings the fifth E, which is the end. And by the end, I just mean what's coming, not like the end, the end. But the end will be peace. I couldn't find an E for peace, so it was just the end. <laughs> so the result of Gideon's boldness was peace for the nation. Judges chapter 8, two chapters over, verse 28. The result of all of this is thus... Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During, during Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace 40 years. The land had peace 40 years during Gideon's lifetime. True peace requires the boldness to change ourselves first. 
True peace requires the boldness to change ourselves first. Gideon, in this moment, doesn't get his circumstances changed until he changes. Until he moves from a terrified subsistence farmer out in a wine press, hiding away, to the mighty warrior that God calls him to be, the circumstances then change. You see, friends, if we are going to see our circumstances change, we need to be the ones that change first. We need to be the ones who say to God, like the disciples did in Acts chapter 4, Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the holy name of your servant Jesus Christ. You see, inner change is the only thing that's going to bring true true peace. They They don't pray to ask God to change their circumstances. They pray, they say, God, be aware of the circumstances and change us. Help us to have the boldness to speak out. Because they understand that if they are able to change into those who are bold and to speak the gospel, the circumstance will eventually change. And why? Why are they able to pray like this? How do they have such wisdom, these unschooled fishermen and people? Because they had been with Jesus. Before that, a bit before that, in in Peter and John's encounter with the with the Sanhedrin, effectively, the the leaders of their time. It said, when they saw that Peter and John were unschooled men, but they had been with Jesus, they took note. You see, this is what the disciples had seen Jesus do. In their walk with him, in their apprenticeship, in their discipleship, and being with Jesus, they had seen Jesus over and over again come to situations and demonstrated that it's change that needs to happen in us first, before the change will happen out there in our circumstances. Jesus didn't worry often about the circumstances that were going on. He spoke the word of God boldly. He prayed for healing. And there were signs and miracles that followed him. Those three things that they pray for, Jesus did. That's that's why they're asking for it. Because that's what they had seen Jesus do. They had seen him come and bring the authority of the kingdom of God in his teaching and in in his works. In his words and his works. They had come and seen Jesus live like that. Wherever he went, he demonstrated an immense boldness in bringing the gospel of the kingdom. Reuben, Reuben P. Job puts it like this, speaking on this, uh, this topic in, in Acts chapter 4. He says, The early disciples found that praying for boldness gave them the wisdom, the faith, and the power to live faithful and effective lives. How many of us want to live faithful and effective lives for the gospel? Man, I do. I want to live a life where God says, well done, good and faithful servant. But I also want to live a life that is effective, that brings change, that changes circumstances. And they knew in this situation, as we see in Acts 4, that praying for boldness was the key that would unlock that. That would be the thing that gives them the wisdom, the faith, and the power to live in a way that God required of them. We, as God's disciples, should be so bold as to live the same way. You can be bold because of who God is. You might say, man, that's not me. That's not my normal personality. But we can be bold in our own ways because of who God is. Charles Stanley puts it like this. He said, his voice leads us not into timid discipleship, but into bold witness. His voice leads us not into timid discipleship, but bold witness. When we hear the voice of God, and that is a, that is a speaking of the intimacy and the closeness with God. We need... We can't hear the voice of God, number one, if you're not listening. And number two, if you're not with God. And I know God's with us kind of in an omnipresent way all the time, and I'm not discounting that, but there's a way where you can be with someone and not listen to them. And all the wives nodded. (laughs) So we can be with God in that way, where we're just kind of going along and He's there and He's part of our life, but we're not actually listening to Him. And those are, the, those are the times when we, when we lose that boldness, when we, we're not really listening and paying attention. You know, the other thing about boldness is that boldness is contagious. Boldness is contagious. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, and he's writing out of prison. He's under arrest, and he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result... It has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, 
most of the brothers and sisters have become confident or bold in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul is saying to the Philippians, he's saying, because of my boldness in sharing the gospel, I have been put in prison. And because of continuing to share the gospel while he's arrested and in chains, everybody else knows, the others have been encouraged to become more bold. It just takes a small spark, friend, to set off those around us to be more bold for the, for the gospel. See, what the world needs is not more politicians, it doesn't need better investment bankers. It doesn't need better welders. It doesn't need better mechanical engineers. It doesn't need better leaders. What the world needs is more disciples of Jesus who do those things, who are politicians. It needs disciples who are chemical engineers, disciples who are leaders, disciples who are... It needs more disciples of Jesus because... When true disciples of Jesus become investment bankers, they'll change the way that investment happens. And the end result of that will be peace. When we are bold for Jesus, we will change far more than just our own circumstances. Far more than just the threshing wheat in the wine press. We just want to be okay in our little thing. When we're bold for Jesus, we're going to change families, communities, cities, regions, and beyond. But we must first allow God to change me. That's where it starts. God comes and speaks to each one of us and says, the Lord, be with, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. We must first become those who will be bold in our proclaiming of the gospel, in praying for healings, looking for signs and wonders, allowing God's power and authority to move. And then we will see peace. Then peace will come. How many of you want peace? would be nice, eh? Can you imagine peace with our government? Peace with our families? True biblical peace with our families, with our friends, with our communities, with other races and nations. True biblical peace with our environment. Can you imagine that? How beautiful it would be. I want to close with this out of Romans 15. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are a God who is present with us. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are present with us in a way that is more real than we could ever dream or imagine. I thank you that you are present with us in a way that empowers us. I pray, God, that you open our hearts to see and to know your presence with us. I pray this morning for a boldness to come on us in situations where we would normally be fearful, God. I pray for a boldness to overcome giants that we have faced day in and day out and turned and run from. Lord, I pray that you give us the boldness to go and to proclaim your gospel. I pray that you give us the boldness to pray for healings, the boldness to pray for signs and wonders to see, Lord. We want to see your kingdom advance, Jesus. We want to see your authority come on earth, Lord. And Father, I pray for every person here that like Gideon, you would encounter them, God. That you would engage us, God. That you would answer our excuses, that you would empower us, and that in the end we would experience your peace. Help us to be those who are bold in the little things, Lord. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.